Hello, everyone, and welcome for the program Conversations with Artists with Shazia Sikandar and Lila Kazmi, presented by the Seattle Art Museum's Gardner Center for Asian Art and Ideas. Today's program is one of three organized with Lila Kazmi. The others are with artists Helen Zugai and Hung Lu. They are also available on the Seattle Art Museum blog. Uh, to introduce the two of them uh, to, for you, Shazia Sikander is an artist born in Pakistan and internationally recognized. Uh, her practice takes classical Indo-Persian miniature painting as its point of departure and challenges the genre by experimenting with scale and various forms of new media. Uh, her work is informed by South Asian, American, feminist, and Muslim perspectives. And uh, she has earned a BA, BFA in 1991 from the National College of the Arts in Lahore, Pakistan. And then uh, she moved to the United States to pursue an MFA at the Rhode Island School of Design. Uh, her interdisciplinary practice involves painting, animation, installation, video, and collaboration with composers and authors. And her work um, in, has been shown in a number of special ex in solo exhibitions at the Asia Society in Hong Kong, the Guggen Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, the Irish Museum of Modern Art in Dublin, the Hirshhorn Museum in Washington, DC, and uh, the Seattle Art Museum was fortunate to be able to show her work in the early 1990s in an Asia Society exhibition titled Conversations with Tradition. Uh, thank you for doing this, Shazia Sikander. And then to introduce Lila Cosme, she is a two-time Emmy award-winning producer, director, and editor, and a six-time nominee. Her documentary shorts have aired on PBS television stations in Seattle, San Diego, on the Seattle Channel, and streamed on the PBS NewsHour, as well as being included in quite a few film festivals and uh, showcases. She received her second Regional Emmy Award for the documentary short Los Artistas, the artist featuring stories of four Latino artists. And uh, she has lived in Pakistan, Bahrain, Chicago, and Seattle. And I'll turn it over to the two of you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and thank you, Shazia, for being here. It's such a pleasure to have this chance to have a conversation with you. Thank you. I, I'm really appreciative of this opportunity. So I actually um, first saw your work in person in Seattle at the Seattle Art Museum many years ago when you had an you were part of an exhibit here, um, and of course I've followed your work since then. And it's just been amazing to see your progress and how you have opened doors and inspired so many you know a whole new generation of artists. Um, so I wanted to I wanted to start out you know at the beginning. So being beginning being college. Um, so you went to uh, NCA, National Co College of Arts in uh, Lahore, Pakistan, um, and you decided to study miniature. So, and actually let's, let's briefly talk about what is miniature for those uh, who may be new to the concept. Yes, so miniature painting is a difficult term, I think. There will be many art historians that will disagree because it's, it's a difficult term to place such a large idea, a, a canon of visual arts, you know, that can geographically go from, um, from all the way from China into East Europe or even in other location sites. So when, I, how, um, so as we will talk further, we'll elaborate more on what this term exactly um, encompasses and means. But very briefly, I would say that book art, the illuminated manuscripts, um, things that have been very much in, in, in the idea of the book. So that's how I, I think of it. It's very syncretic in, in, in its um, tradition. It also has had a whole history of colonial um, um, engagement, which means so much of the work is no longer, you know, in in the regions that it was created, but has is in all over the world in different institutions, mostly many in the West, in storages, many art, many 
uh, aspects of the manuscripts have been torn and placed in the, into the secondary markets. You know, so there's this whole sort of history of, uh, uh, of looting and plundering also in, mm -hmm. associated to it. So, mm -hmm. so sort of like that's how my interest in, in, the, mm -hmm. in, in this idea of the miniature painting is also in terms of how it's not necessarily just about scale. It's not like mm -hmm. everything is done in a, in a right. small manner. It's yeah, a, we'll, we'll talk about that as yeah. we your work. And, and you have a slideshow that you were going to share with us too, so we get to see some of the images as we talk. Absolutely. So I will share my screen now. And um, starting uh, literally from the very beginning, mm -hmm. I thought I would share um, just examples of uh, some of the early works, which mm -hmm. is basically um, when I'm a student at the National College of Art in Pakistan in Lahore with the, with the master miniature painter Bashir Ahmed and uh, these would be examples of looking at um, um, images of the historical works and deriving inspiration from that almost sort of copying uh, figurative uh, forms mm -hmm. or on the one on the right side is actually uh, the border is different, maybe the colors are different, but that particular iconic image of the two characters mm -hmm. is, uh, is a copy. Um, so sort of engaging with a little bit of, of like learning the techniques and as well as um, uh, copying some of the older works. So those, so, are, those uh, would be early exercises. Early exercises. And uh, so at the time when you began studying miniature, it was not really widely studied in uh, South Asia. Um, what made you pick miniature as a field? Uh, ex I think exactly that same reason that one was unfamiliar. I was we, growing up in Pakistan. It's not like one was, you know, going to see art in the museum. Also, to give full perspective, my, uh, I, like the background of my sort of at that time is 1980s. So that decade is very much a very uh, significant time of change happening. It's the military dictatorship, Ziaul Huq's regime. That's the time when, you know, in the background is the uh, war with the Soviet, the Fran, US Park War, which is 1978 to 92. So there, there's also the rise of of Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, US military presence in Afghanistan, Northern Pakistan, cultures changing, shifting very dramatically. Mm -hmm. And I think at that time, um, I was uh, thinking about art and the crossovers of art and uh, how women engage with art. And also I think there's this other kind of shift that's happening, which for me is this sort of uh, women's rights issues Mm -hmm. um, the blasphemy laws, Hadood ordinances, um, that type of Islamization project that was happening, you know, which was again sort of diminishing women's rights. So coming of age at that time, you're mm -hmm. becoming equally aware of those types of limitations. So I was gravitating to women leaders, to topics around around women's emancipation, women's contribution, et cetera, et cetera. So one of my early mentors is um, the late artist um, Lala Ruh. And I think at that time working with the Women Action Forum and then from WAF kind of entering into the National College of Arts. Mm -hmm. So there's that sort of journey, you know, coming from mm -hmm. a little bit of a, of a different perspective into art kind of gravitating at the possibility of what creative expression means in terms of dissent, even in terms of like younger generation uh, that, that, you know, is going to engage in some kind of expression. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and at that time, the National College of Arts, I gravitate to miniature painting because I too am unfamiliar about, uh, about what that means. What is it? Who, who gets to determine that is our tradition? And what does that mean in terms of, you know, what is it, what in general is a tradition, but what, who gets to claim what? Mm -hmm. And those are, those I think are threads that run through the early works, through all the different 
mm-hmm. stages of my of of my practice quest continues to question you know who gets to uh define a story who gets to <clears throat> gets to tell no. the story that perspective <clears throat> of history interesting yeah and we see that um you know the feminine form and exploration of role of the female throughout your work you know and as we go on we'll see in the later work as well um, um so this piece uh, that we're looking at so these would be uh, what are the dimensions how these are small they, yeah size? these are small so if you say like 12 inches notebook page size and uh, very detailed here a little bit of shift is happening from the last two images like i am now maybe the nate borders are opening up literally also like new types of perspectives are coming in i'm engaging with people i know so characters and people i want to identify with or want to bring bring as individuals into the work portraiture to some extent action which is happening you know simultaneously again often in congress school the woman would be awaiting an event which she is unable to control so this play on that idea that why what is the woman awaiting is she in proactive is she engaged with uh, with the past in creative ways so I, these are still i am a student so you know things are happening and shifting but not that dramatically and then this was um my thesis work which was at that time quite a rupture it was uh, in terms of scale also at 5 feet um a, a different idea in terms of just a a small scale page scale image or series of paintings here i was more interested in bringing the uh, um a, a much more um mm-hmm. abstract idea of of a youth you know the the anxiety of the youth i'm i'm like tapping into that moment as a young young artist and wanting to in, represent that so it's sort of i i think of the scroll um as a uh, kind of a day in a life or the lifetime or a kind of a narration occurring in a timeless manner i am also looking at um Safavid period. I'm mm-hmm. also looking at the vernacular of local architects. I think uh, uh, the Pakistani architect uh, Nayar Ali Dada, his aesthetic. So, sort of looking at languages that uh, that are allowing me to really un- understand um, space, drawing, <laughs> uh, surface, how different surfaces operate, the animate, inanimate. and the protagonist in the work is maybe a, a young girl or you know you never see her face whether it's a self portrait or not is again open ended mm-hmm. it's also a little bit about um really how um to create a link with uh safavid as something which is predates the colonial era so i'm not necessarily looking at the art historical references that might be of a uh, recent time from mostly mm-hmm. western perspective but really going further back in time mm-hmm. and this is the work uh, the scroll is uh, you did in your uh, gra- you know in your last year of school and it really is considered a pioneering work and kind of is what gave uh, led to the neo miniature uh, the new miniature movement and um and it is uh, you know um so in in this uh, miniature traditionally was uh, um, depicting images from rajput and mughal courts and here you have you really went you know beyond that and brought it into the contemporary realm where you're predicting uh, you this is um, a day in the life of this girl in cont- in current times right uh yeah mm-hmm. at some level of course it yeah. is here you see me you know literally i i don't know when is it oh my god a long time ago this is me sort of yeah preparing the scale is also very different so it did launch um a trend mm-hmm. you know all the way that i know at least till 2014 because that's when bashir ahmed who's pictured here 
um, was, I think he retired that year from the National College of Arts and he's always expressed that as recently as my visit in 2019, that, you know, um, he uh, like this one, like students doing a thesis would often then engage with like a big circular shape or a rectangle or something one kind of one large scale thesis work. So mm -hmm. it sort of started, it, it created that type of a trend. But I also think that at that time, you know, um, I was asked to come teach right away. And I started mm -hmm. teaching in 1992 with Bashir Ahmed. And um, that also um, inspired people, you know, a year, two or three years only younger to me on the sidelines to see that this engagement can can happen with tradition by the youth and mm -hmm. that I saw that shift occur in those years where all of a sudden we were just one or two people with Bashir and then it starts to open up and he gets more real estate in the school and you know the department moves from a small room into a larger mm -hmm. setup and more and more students come in so that's that um, is a very sort of a iconic kind of um yeah it's uh it's interesting because you know scroll looking back now it's considered a pioneering work in in miniature um contemporary miniature and uh we we don't have an image of it but the first panel of the scroll is the girl you know she's going in she's on the steps and opening the door and walking into the house and it's almost like you know she's taking us on a journey and that's really what you've done in real life through your work and I know, don't have it here yeah it is literally it's a threshold so it's like walking into the doorway walking mm -hmm. into something which is opening the door into a new space into a new world and, um, and I think at that time too, it was for me, like literally like going, diving into history, diving into um, the historical dimension of different schools of painting that were not necessarily at that time pre-internet um, that you couldn't Google, right? So <laughs> you were limited to a couple of books which would be circulating in the library or somebody had gone abroad and had brought a book or two. So understanding the range of stylistic range and schools of miniature painting to really get a sense of what we were talking about was not, not, not readily available. In mm -hmm. fact, it was much later with research and w definitely with um, with traveling outside of Pakistan that I started to get a better sense of how diverse uh, the idea or the visual canon is. And mm -hmm. that's when you start wondering like, why is it called miniature painting? You know, and, and mm -hmm. is it geographically linked to Pakistan or India or is it wider? So of course, these, are, these, these questions are incredibly relevant and um, they need to be kept in the back of our discussion as we're thinking about, um, about the work and understanding it because it's not, uh, you know, it's not like, a, a, it's not just about a cultural specificity. It's about a very long, several hundred years long tradition mm -hmm. in different regions. And it's about, it's, it's, um, it's about that social political time over a long period of time. So, um, so then you, um, you come to the United States, you study at RIDZ, and this, uh, this one of the pieces we're looking at right now, reinventing the, this location, is that um, from the experience, is, is that referring to, in some ways, your dislocation also from moving from Pakistan to the United States? Yes. Definitely, it's that dislocation. It's also a dislocating the language, the language of the miniature as I understood it at that time, at that moment. It's also trying to uh, create or, uh, 
a kind of a the overlapping diasporas is what I would say mm -hmm. now with time is I was seeking to find communities that I that where I I was uh, finding common ground. Mm -hmm. So this is happening. I think some of these paintings are happening in early years of being in Houston because I finished my master's at the Rhode Island School of Design. And then I went to uh, Houston. So I was there for a couple of years. And then at that time, I was also, you know, when I kind of uh, had opportunity to come to New York and do exhibitions there, there is this crossover between uh, Houston and New York for me too. And these two paintings actually exemplify that. The, mm -hmm. the one on the left was done in Texas during my project at the Project Row Houses and the one on, on the right was sort of similar around that same time, but engaging with, a, with my time in New York, early mm -hmm. year or two of New York. And uh, yes, the idea of dislocation is, is informing the work, but also in terms of finding a language. Mm -hmm. How does an artist come up with an iconography that is completely theirs, that is not being appropriated from old paintings. Of course, this idea of bringing anything anew is not new. You know, we all, all, all of us are, are kind of engaged in some way with a conversation with what all of us are doing simultaneously. So it's never going to be completely different and completely new. But this idea was interest, of interest to me because in, at that time, it was very much about this idea of deconstruction, right? So what, does, what did that mean? And I was questioning that too, while at the same time, I was aware that the idea of miniature painting was very much a truncated notion because historically it's not like all preserved in a linear manner it it has been dispersed it's in different museums mm -hmm. archives and history so this idea of you know looking in looking at the archives is a very truncated notion because only in recent years so much of that is now digitally available but 20 years ago none of that was accessible available unless you actually saw a show which would be up at a museum or you had access and were able to go and look at at the collections at the Mets uh, storage or you know so, so so forth so 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 much of this notion of dislocation is not necessarily about the personal mm -hmm. it's not like I'm gonna not start making stories about myself it's right. really taking kind of a broader perspective on how um, gender is represented and especially on narratives that get erased or expunged and often feminine narratives are are kind of suffering that but collectively the tradition also um, how it deals with visibility and lack of visibility and so so some of the forms are playful and play on that idea like the one on the right mm -hmm. the feminine form with no legs and no arms, but self-rooted and afloat. You know, that notion of, of a dislocation is almost um, buoyant and pleasing, if not fully pleasing, but it's not something that is saying I'm a victim. <laughs> it's, it, it is, uh, it has, it, for me, it was like, I, I'm self-rooted. I can, you know, I, I'm, I can, I can understand who I am if I examine myself but I may be like yeah so these forms I was these forms were also happening by studying uh, sculpture so when we if we get to the end of our slide presentation <laughs> that particular reference to the apsara this is my abstraction of that form the one on the right I see okay and then um and yeah. this continues, these sort of like little characters or like little monsters, as I call them, as if like, you know, how to create an iconography. So I'm looking at forms, I'm looking at um, those big catalogs often of Indian art or Islamic art, large category, in all condensed into a book. And then you're supposed to cull your experience out of that, right? Mm -hmm. So then I was thinking, what if I see them as these 
little monsters that are going to crawl off the page and you know and in inhabit a different um space or home for themselves so mm -hmm. that to question the way categories exist or how categories are all still the small miniature size yeah these are those were little characters and forms that i was deriving by thinking on those ideas as well as looking at sculpture and then i was finding ways to incorporate them into the paintings i was making so like the one on the right where the woman is holding one of those forms for me that little character is like the chalava so i'm not sure you know punjabi speaking people might know what a chalava is so the chalava is really a, a kind of a half different animals coming together a mythic idea of of something which is being lost in time or some mm -hmm. something that is so fast that you can never pin it down so i was giving so that's that character starts to sort of appear in the drawing plus mm -hmm. i think other things that are happening here the archetypal images of the perfect male or the perfect woman kind of playing with those playing with uh, narratives that are universal but still i think um how we how growing up in Pakistan, some of the, uh, of, as a child, like so many of the tales are coming, you know, they may be global, but th then they may have different associations, the darker side of children's stories, especially for young girls and kind of playful, playful titles then and now, now is National Organization of Women. So it's like, I'm playing with breaking also the idea of of sexuality and gender too, as early as in some of these works. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow, that's uh, things are just And also, fun. you know, kind of like in, in Houston, when I was there, I was looking at, like I, I had gravitated to the African-American community there and was very involved when I did a project with the Project Row Houses, but to really think in terms of like, what are some of the crossovers of, of use of narrative and form and um, um, you know, uh, storytelling through music. And, and part of me was also tapping into my childhood time of having spent time in Somalia and Mogadishu. So my interest perhaps may be coming from having had experience of a, a, a time in Africa independent, which was very different lens for a South Asian, you know, to bring that perspective and, mm -hmm. and find like what are the overlaps with mm -hmm. different um, communities of color. And here we're looking at many, many faces of Islam, which was, uh, you know, before 9-11 and it's something that ended up being kind of a for, uh, foresight on your part and predictive of what was America's relationship to the Muslim world was going to be, you know, and and but this was done in nine, you know, um, ninety seven, ninety seven into ninety nine, because mm -hmm. these are w drawings that take a long time to make. So I think at that time I had already started the borders, and I was thinking, but I wasn't, I had not placed portraits in them. So I was developing this piece and like many, the way artists work, at least how I work, I will start several paintings simultaneously and some may sit there for a year or two or three and mm -hmm. I may revisit them later. So I remember when New York Times was looking at, had asked me to be part of this uh, project, uh, which was imagining the millennium. And I, I remember at that time thinking what topic, you know, would be prominent. Mm -hmm. So it's done in 99, so definitely prescient in terms of like two years before September 11. Mm -hmm. Right. But it was really about how U.S. foreign policy would, um, would basically be the most prominent topic, its engagement in Muslim countries. Mm -hmm. So from that perspective, who are the shapeshifters, who, who has been a friend and now it's a foe, how all of that keeps um, shifting. Mm -hmm. And uh, the we Persian, see, we see, you know, yeah. artists and political figures and um, feminists, uh, in you know, very prominent in this. Absolutely. Um, you know, I was uh, reading something um, it, in which they had uh, uh, talked to, uh, 
quoted Aisha Jalal, um, uh, Professor Aisha Jalal, who was very, very much um, appreciative of, and recognizing of your work. Um, uh, but she said that, you know, your work is not necessarily overtly political or uh, you're not making a political statement. Um, to me, in many ways, when I, a lot of your work I look at, it is very political. Yeah, I, I think the work is, uh, has always been political. I, um, I think, I, I don't know, you know, mm -hmm. like people may not necessarily know the work, mm -hmm. but then, um, or may mm -hmm. just have seen one, one type of work. Like I think as a, as a visual artist, I, I am not really just making illustrations. Mm -hmm. I, I have to keep a degree of, of, um, mystery in the work too. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so, you know, so that there are multiple vantage points where you can come with different interpretations, where you can project interpretations, where, where things are, are making you think. So, so maybe in that way, it's not like, you know, overt, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's going to put a hammer on your head and just <laughs> hammer it down. Like, this is it. <laughs> You know, and, and I think that for me is very much, very important for me, because I also think a lot of that work is about time. Like even this particular painting, like how it is, I think one of the most political paintings, mm -hmm. but when I made it 20 years ago, it did not, um, you know, it was a harder painting, but it got a, re it got reviewed in 2017, almost like 20 years later wow. in hyperallergic, where it was part of a show which was uh, I think on the South Asian diaspora but it got very uh, it, it was called an American masterpiece mm -hmm. so that is interesting you know how when you think of of South Asians in America the mm -hmm. Asian idea in America between something which is so black and white this the country then you know there how do how does the Asian art uh, what type of um, identity emerges. Mm -hmm. And I think in that sense, this particular work has uh, been very relevant in time that mm -hmm. it was done then, and then it gets reviewed 20 years later. But there, for, for me, that's very indicative of this sort of um, yeah. a difficult place of being, a, this, this being an Asian in, in the US. And this is so, you know, kind of predictive of what happened that we see, you know, with the, that form Statue of Liberty pointing, each side is pointing guns at each other. It's the mistrust or, you know, skepticism about each other that followed. So this is, you know, it's incredible work. Um, so, Let's see. Oh, uh, so I wanted to. Sorry, um, I wanted to talk about you brought up uh, um, identities, you know, and I think one of the amazing things uh, uh, that I find when I see work by um, Helen Zureb or you and um, uh, Hung Lu, it's really you know broadening and. Um, and the definition of American art, like what is American art? Because it's, you know, with where when artists from all over the world are here and how does that impact art, the definition of, of American art? And then also for you, uh, do you, when you were, when you first came here versus now, do you see a difference in how, are you are you treated as a Pakistani artist, as an American artist, or an artist? Yeah. All of the above. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's always been like that. I'm not sure how much of change has occurred. I remember early on, I of course one is seen much more as the recent sort of immigrant, so Pakistani. Pakistani is much more prevalent, but I've been in Asian, South Asian, women artists, Muslim, Muslim artists. artists, you yeah. know. And of course, uh, in conversation with the idea of America as something that is constantly changing and shifting. And, you know, even being in the Whitney Biennial in 1997, I remember there was some concern of oh, can Shazia be in this biennial? It's 
the Whitney America, it's the Whitney Museum of American Art. And, you know, and at that time, I recall uh, reaching out and telling them that, hey, I'm not a US citizen. Because <laughs> I was being told that you can't be in the show. So I was worried. I was nervous that, oh, maybe I, uh, they're inviting me. Maybe I, I can't be in the show. So mm -hmm. these, these yeah, things, yeah. yeah, so these things constantly, I think, circulate um, certain artists far more mm -hmm. than some other artists. But definitely, in my experience, these categories have, have, been, um, have been very prevalent, have been placed on my work have been placed on me, depending on different periods of time and depending on different contexts. So mm -hmm. I've been through in and out of many of these categories. Some mm -hmm. I may have chosen myself, some, may, uh, some I might have reacted to or pushed back at, but they have, they, they are there. They're mm -hmm. very much there. And, um, and you know, um, even like even this particular walk, Pleasure Pillars, though it's not a it's not a meeting place of East and West. Oftentimes, you know, no work people will see it. Oh, it's a conversation where somebody from East is coming to the West, and that's thus it's a commingling. And uh, my work was never really about that. Like this particular work was really a statement about how U.S. wars in Islamic countries have often be, be, been on this premise of saving the Muslim woman. And mm -hmm. here, you know, it was a, it was a kind of an argument uh, to counter that. It's also about the pleasurable notion of the feminine, the desire. So it's not just the desire, but the desire and the fear. And then playing on those aspects, then saying, you know, East meets West. So, so, so the nuances often get, would get hijacked. And so many mm -hmm. times, you know, you, these are things not in your control. So like, of course, um, um, the work is, once it leave, leaves your studio and it's out there, it's, go, mm -hmm. it's good that it can open up many conversations, whether mm -hmm. some conversations are going to go in another direction and some will go in some other direction. For me, that's been my journey is like, I want to open up multiple interpretations. Mm -hmm. And Even, that is the role of art, right? Just starting conversations, starting challenging notions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And even here, you know, stepping outside of the small drawings, literally, literally, mm -hmm. like if I took elements from my paintings and started painting them large, and would the reception be different to my work, to who I was? Because I was no longer making the small Mm -hmm. women paintings I you know so I was playing on that I was also uh interested in 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 issues of scale and labor and also some of the works that would be painted on large-scale surfaces would not necessarily engage with the type of preciousness that the small detailed paintings would mm -hmm. um people would respond to right so I was like breaking kind of boundaries with shifting the material um the scale the message as well as really engaging physically with the making of the work too mm -hmm. with my full body so and also that's very different. the definition of miniature right as people have known it you're going off the page and really you know large you know the scale is much bigger than what yeah. made scale is bigger it's also like there's no boundaries anymore so mm -hmm. like this this installation could continue outward it wasn't and it and you could like depending on where you were standing you would have multiple viewing positions so you mm -hmm. could see the details painted on the wall you could see how the images coalesce and come together through the transparent paper or you could walk through the piece so these these were these were some of the early uh, ways in which I started to really explore mm -hmm. uh, how I where I wanted to go. So I didn't really just say, okay, I have this window of attention. Let me start churning out miniatures after miniatures. Mm -hmm. So I that was just not who I was. I was really interested in evolving iconographies, understanding 
community, understanding politics, understanding the idea of who gets to tell a story, understanding also a, a kind of a visual canon, which was outside of the Western canon, and then the politics of nations, how can we? Work. Can you mention? Uh, can you talk about the material? Uh, what is? Uh, yeah. What so the the wall drawings are all in acrylic, mm -hmm. and so much of the drawings that I do on the paper here is uh, ink, gouache, and um, I use water based material in the small drawings. Also, these have been yeah. These are directly on wall. These are all acrylic. So mm -hmm. these large scale wall drawings, I think, uh, where eventually, you know, this process of working in layers, especially like these, led to animation. So it was very natural because again, I'm using uh, um, After Effects, which is all about building things in layers. So mm -hmm. it was a very natural way of going in the direction of kinetic works. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we see that uh, that image, the you know the black, which I now know is the hair. Uh, oh the, yeah. The hair, we see that through in a lot of your work, and that's what um, the earlier image with the collaboration with the uh, Shur, is it Shurmila Desai? Yeah. Dance? That's is that where that came from? Well, it came from many things. It came like here is a great example of that image. So if you look at all these little characters that are in this uh, court, kind of the idea of the court painting, so mm -hmm. they would not naturally, women wouldn't na naturally be um, protagonists in this type of architecture. These would be court paintings, which are mostly, uh, you know, during the Mughal era, and it's going to have men and the king, et cetera, playing a role, appearing in in uh within this mm -hmm. format within this architecture so what i did is i pl pl first put all the women in there then as i rem i removed all their bodies so you mm -hmm. can see now that the the imprint that is left like like a little dna that's left behind mm -hmm. it's like the hair and that could be as easily as you or me just tying a hair <laughs> and the mm -hmm. right. bun that's there so that's what it, that's what it really is. So, but it was small enough that I could choreograph in move and create movements. So it was the idea of the particle, and then that particle could be moved around in different ways. And and eventually, you know, you, when it when in a space like Times Square, Times Square mm -hmm. when these. Uh, kind of hair that people thought were bats would descend at midnight. It was, it was, it, it, I found it really um, insightful mm -hmm. and almost a little playful and full of humor, but at the same time engaging with something so um, mm -hmm. rigid as in its form, like the hair, that shape, I don't change. But when you multiply it, it can be so fluid and almost liquid like versus when you reduce it to its singular form it's very precise so this idea of like how difference can coexist but can uh, conjure up new associations and how iconographies can change just by multiplication and then of course the context here to see it in times square at this scale is a very different idea of shifting out out of the border of the page, out of the out of the walls of an institution, the museum, and then it's in a completely different space. Right. Yeah. And then you went, um, and we talked about you know uh, this idea of the feminist that's been very prevalent throughout your work. And then here we're looking as, at a series of portraits that you did. Yes. So portraiture has run throughout my practice in different ways and sometimes in a little more abstract way, sometimes in a, you know, in projects that I've done like the monks and novices series that I did in Luan Prabang uh, with the quiet in the land. And then in general, as you saw in some of the miniature paintings, there are portraits appear or the full body appears with a very precise idea of who the protagonist is. So 
here I was really engaged with the uh, with feminists, feminist mm-hmm. scholars, writers, so that I could uh, create a conversation between like Femida Riaz and Adrian Rich. Mm-hmm. You know, they would not, people obviously may hear here will know Adrian Rich, but how many will know Femida Riaz? Mm-hmm. And this way, like if I started to reread their texts with different perspectives, then I was going to open up new ideas for me also. So some of these series are, are around that idea where... Um, La La and Rita Franklin, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so some of this portraiture that you're seeing here is coming, you know, it's made in ink in a very sort of quick gestural manner, but also where I may stylize the character that I'm imagining, but also I'm not really trying to just um, mimic their face, like, for example, like Fatima Mernisi, it, it, some people may think it looks like her, some may not, but for me, Fatima Mernisi is so much more than just a portrait. It, she opens up so many, uh, she creates ruptures in, in mm-hmm. how, you know, representation theoretically for women and women in Islam and what it means and reading her at that time uh, was very instrumental in the 1990s for me to read about her, what uh, her books, and then also to step back from that and understand them in the perspective of, of uh, where that discourse existed and how I could then think of other protagonists like mm-hmm. even Angela Davis and um, mm-hmm. poets. So these are and when are, 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 what is the time frame? When are these done? Are these done over years or some of them? Are so no, I like I was reading about Fatima and Angela Davis at that time in the late 90s. Mm-hmm. But I think I did the portraits recently. Mm-hmm. Right. So so the portraits physically, the ones that you're seeing are done recent, are recent, right. in the last two, three years, mm-hmm. or maybe three or four years ago. But but the but why them is because they have been instrumental in in my ways of understanding, you know, or mm-hmm. defining what is the feminine form in a very political space, the the idea of the feminine in a political space. And then I actually will show you another example. Like this portrait was maybe done for uh, Mary Magdalene for Tosca at the Met Opera. Mm-hmm which probably was done in, you know, a while ago when it was showing in New York City. Mm -hmm. And at that time also is looking at this protagonist from another perspective outside of say the representation from a Western iconography. And then eventually I thought of Mary Magdalene and started to think like there are so many different Marys and Miriams and Mariams. Mm -hmm. And what is that idea historically in the space of nature? And then that led to the fountain. So here you see the face emerge out of water and, uh, and up close, it's very abstract. So it's only like sometimes like you would have to look down at the piece when you see the face coming out, mm-hmm. but, but up close, it can be quite, uh, it can be so again, a kind of a, a mosaic. Play. Yeah, it's done in mosaic in glass tile. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's I love that. Yeah, <laughs> you asked me to put it in. <laughs> Metal apart. Yes, I did. It's right there. <laughs> in 2012, yeah, and and yeah. we see you know Carrie me uh, Carrie May Reams and some of the other artists. Um, and and what is that you know when you and you've also gotten the um, sitar and taz from uh, in Pakistan as well. Um, so what is that? Uh, mean uh, to you as an artist that type of recognition you know medal of honor for as an american artist and also you have you know an honor as a pakistani artist does that have influence uh, the, the, does that impact artwork or how you see yourself no. as an artist it doesn't imp- i every time i have to make a new work i have I, I, I have to like, oh my God, what am I going to make? <laughs> you know, so making of art is, is always 
you you always start as if you've never done anything before <laughs> like that's that it's with the same anxiousness insecurities not knowing wanting to do more wanting you know the so that never changes for me i i every time i'm like i have to think research question make things you know share them with with other artists have conversations doubt it and then come to it so i wish it was simpler <laughs> so the the metal doesn't really change much it was it was a fantastic um of course it's very you know the recognition for any artist is is invaluable it's encouraging and uh, especially in terms of being part of that group of artists that you just saw mm -hmm. um uh, that was a great honor i wanted to show you that at that time this is from that event so mm -hmm. the medal of art ceremony i was able to show a piece at that event and last pose is, is uh almost i think at 150 feet wide so that was very exciting to be able to also um, do some projection for the actual ceremony. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and I've been, we talked about it earlier, like how scale started to automatically um, find its way in my pursuit of deconstructing the miniature. So I, I was making, uh, I started making animations early, like 2000, 2001, mm -hmm. alongside experiments on the wall and those layered paperwork. So uh, animations at that time are very uh, limited. There's no um, HD for a long time. And then um, no, no sound or score, but this is, uh, this is a later piece, a very, mm -hmm. this piece, for, has been traveling right now it's at the para museum but i made it in 2013 it's traveled to more than i don't know more definitely more than 20 places around the world and this is an animated piece i mean here we see a image of it but it's an animation yeah it is an animation it's made out of drawings it had um it was done when i was invited to participate in the sharjah art biennial mm -hmm. so it was very much of, of my interest to create a new work and to create a work in the vernacular of the region. It's the score is in Arabic, in both colloquial and classical. There are six poems that the piece is, is uh, using. And those three, those six poems are written by three poets that are local, local to Sharjah that we worked with through the poetry organization and through the Sharjah Art Foundation in, in, in the piece itself. I traveled there many times. I worked with the composer who I've been working with. Diane also traveled with me. So it was, it was a lengthy project to, to create. And it was on the Strait of Hormuz, the history of, of uh, colonial um, uh, maritime histories that are colonial in nature, also the, um, the the history of oil and mm -hmm. the history of colonial and imperial engagements and how um, how you can occupy a space through emotion. A lot of the poetry dealt with that. Uh, it was also about Jalfur as the lost city, lost histories. It, the show had a great, the piece has had great reception. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. it, it, was, uh, it was shown at the Dhakart Summit also it has shown in the mm -hmm. this is this was at the maxi museum a beautiful in beautiful architecture of the space designed by zaha hadid in here it, it was a very different experience because i it was quite large almost maybe 25 meters wide uh, or maybe longer yeah, and you know, then, what you just said almost gives me goosebumps I would have loved to be there watching Shazia Sikandar work in a museum designed by Zaha Hadid it's just incredible. yeah you know and that was so interesting because of what I just want to point out one thing is like when when you're making animation right when you're making anything that's like you're basically using say a big screen computer or in this case three uh, screens because I was thinking one single image that I needed to be very cinematic 
but it does not at no point do you see the work at this scale while making it so mm-hmm. that too is very challenging that you know how which work will test will turn mm-hmm. out successful mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then i i wanted to leave some of the aspects of that space intact like the glass ribbons in the floor here in, mm-hmm. in the way she has designed it so actually if you look down on in these glass ribbons you can look through three floors so very oh, disorienting wow. which i thought was very interesting with this idea of parallax to leave it there rather than like paint everything into a black box right right yeah some of the this was the team that we worked with the the poets and the composer and it talk a little bit about your um collaborations with the composer with Duyan and you were saying you know how it, there hadn't been a lot you don't see a lot of women artists collaborating absolutely and- i i definitely in the way say male collaborators of uh that composers and painters historically have played such a strong part it's like i think in that way uh, collaborating with dion and uh, myself i see that you know um, uh, two immigrants but two asian women mm-hmm. not necessarily just from south asia chinese american pakistani american engaged with the uh, traditional classical languages comp- different but familiar so uh working with her allowed me to um it, to really is a recognize common ground again and to also invest in the relationship so now like a piece we did recently i introduced to yun to a pakistani musician ali seti and mm-hmm. things of that nature would happen naturally you know if they got along then maybe there was potential for ali to be involved in another work disruption as rapture which was at that time uh, in production i was making disruption as rapture it was commissioned by the philadelphia art museum and it was based on this manuscript which is in the vitrine and i wanted um somebody like ali who is trained in classical indian music in sufi music to um to bring his expertise and give a kind of a narration and a um a way of navigating the story through through selection of particular ragas through selection of the recitation and also certain words and they play with each other so a uh, so the piece here at the philadelphia museum has its own permanently um it's there in a permanent site in a mm-hmm. sort of a small alcove the one you see on the left that's the piece it's in a uh a, yeah it kind of in a 4k digital high end screen and you can sit there it has a beautiful ceiling very sort of intimate so mm-hmm. then uh, but the piece also has um taken place at a larger scale so here was the same disruption as rapture playing as part of the new blush festival in toronto and over here the piece the the you know the sound would travel over water huh. and then huh. a lot of the the content in the the piece is about the strife and struggle often where water is a site of peril or the site of expulsion very much like this idea of um the migrant and mm-hmm. the citizen or the history of migration on water or the theft colonial theft on water so there are many many ways of like bringing out that mm-hmm. experience through the animation too but here mm-hmm. i literally was able to place the work on water and play with that here is another just another kind of to give you an idea of like the w- image on the left is is from the manuscript and how i'm playing with it um on the right where the waves and the ocean is built on these particle systems which are basically red flags so the idea of the red flag as peril but then literally taking the flag and making 
making movements of waves and water through it. Mm -hmm. Notion of flight is in the piece. So this disruption that's happening on the left, like uh, these are all made, these bursts are made from all the fairies in the, in the manuscript because the yeah. piece unfolds in the space of dreams. And every time there'd be a dream, a group of fairies comes along and is transporting the protagonist back and forth. So I took those characters and their, their uh, wings and used them as a particle idea again. And I, I, and I work very closely with Patrick O'Rourke who does all the animated works. And that, so there's this kind of a, a collaborative space between Patrick, myself and Dion. Mm -hmm. And uh, which now, uh, you know, we've been working for 10 years with Dion, mm -hmm. with Patrick even more than that, like all the way to thousand. I think uh, something that, you know, I really find interesting about a lot of your collaborations is, um, you know, this idea of art transcending borders. And, you know, because you have Chinese American artist, a composer, Ali Sethi, Pakistani musician, and you, and um, presenting this work, creating the work in America. And, um, and that's, uh, art is innately, uh, you know, you can't tie it to uh, geography. Is is that would that be an accurate way, a description? I I think I think breaking definitely b b borders, boundaries, all these ideas are very much uh, uh, metaphorical as well as literal and physical. And then of course sometimes you know you're making work which may which may not necessarily readily be it readily accessible to an American audience. Mm -hmm. So then what about that types of boundaries? Do you provide a translation or do mm -hmm. you shy away from that work? Like these are things that I often use as, uh, as, as like the armature of what I want to do with, with, with the practice that I have. I don't, I'm not necessarily interested in providing, um, you know, exact lit literal translation for things. Often I'm citing, like if you know, even recent work, if I'm citing Ghalib, you know, like people should know who Ghalib is. Mm -hmm. right. We are living in 2020, like everybody needs to know who Ghalib is. Yeah. So there is this- John, look him up. <laughs> you know? So there is this thing going on, which perhaps 20 years ago as maybe a younger artist with a little less, confidence, different times, no internet, whatever, I might have made different choices. Mm -hmm. But so just I think in that sense, yes, boundaries, borders, contexts are constantly adrift and shifting. And, uh, and that's one one way where collaborative space is exciting. The different voices can step in the work and add, uh, make it fuller without necessarily us all being like homogenized and differences in play is very much there. Often, then I was also wanting to share public art projects. So um, when, when I was making animations, so if you think of the pixel, and then if you say you're gonna equate the idea of the pixel to a unit of the mosaic, what happens then? Suddenly mosaic, which is already a very uh, burdened old craft, right? There's a new way of entering mosaic also so it's similar in ways of how i've been sort of deconstructing miniature but i did not expect that i would start like engaging mosaic but the mm -hmm. problem to solve came about because i had to do public art project which has to engage with material that's long you know can mm -hmm. exist over time so then i had to come up with a solution and i thought glass glass yes. malleable too and glass can translate my drawings well, as well as um, it's a material engaged with light. So here, just an example of my drawing on the left and how it's being translated on the right. And then how this drawing also comes from this, this little element I had taken from the piece that I'd made, the world is yours, world is mine, which was, you can look it up. It's in, it's, I've written about it also in the same op-ed, but basically Langston Hughes and uh, Nasser Jones as like two mm -hmm. characters of storytelling and 
engaging their vernacular and history and where, you know, Africa is at the heart of, mm-hmm. of that discussion. And um, I took that idea. Uh, I wanted to use that idea of the heart very much in this piece too, which again deals with this sort of tension between life and death and man and human nature, man and nature. And it's the beginning of the piece. It starts at the bottom of the building and then it moves uh, in a continuous way through three floors. And then the uh, mm-hmm. here you can see the the piece mm-hmm. from different perspectives, mm-hmm. but here you get a good this idea. This is the installation at Princeton University. Yeah. Yeah. So how how long just installation of that? How long did that take? A piece like that? no, the installation. See, like the work was done very much in another space, and the installation is easy because it's all done in a way where it's like cut up in small pieces, like a puzzle that fits in, and mm-hmm. then the installation is managed within a two weeks mm-hmm. on site. But the making of the work is right. is like longer. And so how long did you work on that? Oh, I, about a year. Yeah. 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 And there, in that same, uh, at Princeton, in the same space in the economics building, there is uh, another entrance and it, over there is the glass painting. Mm-hmm. So um, again, it's an economics building, wanted to engage with histories of economy and East India Company and uh, the, the drawings kind of, play on that theme is Adam Smith's portrait there yeah I wanted to um, come uh, back to today you know this has been you know what a what a year this has been a challenging year for so many reasons for so many people um, and you being in New York which was you know the center of it for so long um, what has that been like are you creating work right now and what type, what are you working on now yeah so I recently had an exhibition and um, some of this I was channeling like the mosaics that I'd been doing in the last two, three years of public art projects, large scale animations, iconographies that had appeared in even parallax that I didn't get to really explore that were resonant to our current situation where we're talking about inequalities and economies and where we all are headed in terms of how we all are interlinked around the world. So I kind of one example would be like when, you know, I was thinking about the histories of oil and oil as this idea which is extractive. So the symbols that are extractive in nature and what are the symbols then that are abundant, that give. So art, literature, poetry, they give their source of abundance versus things that, that you know, are an assault on the living planet. And mm-hmm. with that in mind, I, I've been making, I made these large scale drawings which are almost uh, eight, nine feet and um, Some of the iconographies are based on these histories. This one definitely engages again with um, the the drug histories, the economy, opium trade wars. And that's a that's a petroleum pump that we were looking at. So we were looking at that image, which is which is basically how it where it comes from. The image Mm -hmm. on the left is my take on the photograph that I saw when I was researching. British Petroleum Magazines. The photograph was called a Christmas tree. Yeah. I, it doesn't look Christmas tree, the image on the right, you know, mm-hmm. but it was called Christmas tree. So we actually reached out to that photographer from the 1960s who was still alive, Julian Lush. He was in his 90s and asked him if, you know, and he was more worried that how I was going to use the image of his uh, of the Arabs in the photo. And I was like, I'm, I'm not playing with that. I just wanted to understand why this mm-hmm. thing is being called a Christmas tree. And then I ran with that idea and built the trees. And then as I was developing paintings, they, you know, the pooling of ink is almost like kind of oil, the mm-hmm. black ink, the play on the Tower of Babel of sorts with these Mm -hmm. characters and motion in the back it could be El Greco and an Indian miniature painter colliding it could be you know it's melancholic but it's these are very large also they are done in the same way as I do my small drawings very detailed and layered 
Mm -hmm. uh, this was a little bit like, yeah, like the fires in the background, poppies that are sort of like a flower arrangement in the tree itself, but also like receptacles. Like poppy becomes a symbolically, it's about, again, you know, um, it's in revolutionary poetry. It, it's also kind of bleeding. It's, um, it's again, a reference that is uh, playing with, with nature. This was being, this piece was being informed by all the photos that I was seeing coming out of Australia, the black summer, the fires in California. And how do you, how do you reconcile with something which is so devastating and beautiful at the same time, visually, you know? So it was like, I wanted to channel that. So that's, right. that's also in the piece. That's a, that's a all of it being exhibition. centered around this petroleum pump is also very, you know, metaphorical and given the relationship of America with the Middle East based on oil. So, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Uh, and Parallax is playing, was playing downstairs, which is very much about that history, mm -hmm. about like, about UAE's engagement with the US too. Mm -hmm. And, um, and Disruption is Rapture is playing between these two works. Mm -hmm. And then just perhaps ending here, you can see another mosaic is in the background and then a new sculpture that I'd made where the protagonists are coming from my own work, uh, some of the early works I'd done. So these two protagonists had existed already in the painting. So I was like, if I wanna make a sculpture, I'm just gonna cull those out. And if I cull them out and uh, I still have to solve what's in the back, what's on the side, how do I, how do I make, what challenges that'll come about. So, mm -hmm. Um, I mean, we've talked about, uh, you know, um, the representation of the feminist throughout your work. And this year is, you know, this idea of triumph and struggle of the feminine, you know, of the feminine is global, right? This year, we in America elected uh, our first woman vice president. You know, oh, you, yeah. America, it took 2020, 100 years since uh, the right to vote that we find we finally have a woman vice president you know and so uh, uh, yeah and then you know in the recent years the whole me too movement lots of younger women that are in politics the high, the things are changing and shifting for sure you can see how that's so inspirational for uh, mm -hmm. for even like my generation as well as the very young kids looking up at like women that are making so many uh, voices heard and participate. So this this kind of representation in in mainstream in politics definitely opens up this idea of who gets to be an American, who yeah. gets to be represented. And I think a lot of my work is questioning that has been questioning that constantly, but seem to sort of come about at this time in this particular moment in 2020, a lot of the iconographies were about that type of collective space of women, about um, engaging with vocabularies that are not necessarily always seen readily as in contemporary space, but mm -hmm. it's been jostling and wanting its space in that, in, in, in its kind of, you know, I'm, I'm gonna like find my way in that space. And I think, um, there have been certain conversations around the work that have that that perhaps more people are participating in in questioning what it means to decolonize public space, what it means to have, you know, more participants engaged in such conversations. So it's not no longer just about performing identity or being make your or your work being seen as such. My work was never really about performing my identity, but it has always challenged like very small sort of silos that are around uh, tying art history to nationalism, to mm -hmm. nationalistic identities. And I've always said that, you know, my work is kind of outside, wants to break those binaries. Mm -hmm. And also I think open-ended in the sense like this particular work, for example, where it's also, you know, what, what is the, uh, non-heteronormative mm. can we can we open up that discourse can we open that up within the idea of uh, sacred geometry or islamic art who gets to define what is islamic art 
like that also has been a constant question in my experience of how people see you know which mm-hmm. artists can and which artists can't or some artists are are made so conscious that they will not participate in those conversations so i've been in all of those types of discussions over the last so many years so mm-hmm. here i was like also playing on these ideas of how certain archetypes of women carry the burden of representation and yet you know with that burden in mind can i still make the work open ended and playful and this and, is um, culture. yeah this is this is the bronze sculpture that i was um, before we end i uh, wanted to talk about you have uh, mentioned your uh, show that's coming up you have a survey show that's opening at in new york yes mm-hmm. i have a show it opens at the morgan museum and library in new york city in june to middle june into towards the end of till the end of september Mm-hmm. and it will travel uh to the Rhode Island School of Designs museum as well as to the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston basically kind of following my trajectory from Lahore to Providence to Houston to New York mm-hmm. and it covers like that era from 1980 late 80s into 2002 or 3 so that kind of period and and a, and a very uh, a wonderful book um mm-hmm. that accompanies the show that that addresses the work from many perspectives many south asian scholars are are have uh, are engaging the work um well maybe we will get lucky and it will make its way to seattle <laughs> theater yeah. that would be fantastic <laughs> yeah uh, thank you shazia it's been so delightful to talk to you and very enlightening this these discussions with you and and what you know what you're exploring through your work so thank you for your time it's been a pleasure thank you so much for giving me this opportunity and for engaging the work much appreciated thank you